The issue, uh, whenever I speak about brain in minor traumatic brain injury or mild traumatic brain injury and concussion, things have changed a bit since I, I wrote a textbook on that about 15 years ago. Uh, now, concussion is considered a minor traumatic brain injury. Uh, it's on, if you look at a scale, concussion would be on the lighter end versus severe traumatic brain injury. The issues that are imperative to look at, and pathophysiologically, the things that you want to know, is number one, uh, what happens at the time of the injury. The injury itself is considered history. It's what happens after the injury that's what you're dealing with. So that's a name, traumatic brain injury, mild traumatic brain injury. Pathophysiological aspects, there are three. The first that occurs at that time uh, is probably, the, the, this first one is the least devastating, but it is pretty devastating, is marked accumulation of uh, glut, uh, glutamate, which essentially destroys cells. It burns cells out. It kills cells, number one. Number two, and that's just part of a major metabolic cascade that is uh, anything but helpful to the patient after an injury. Secondly, you have diffuse axonal injury. Uh, shear forces, particularly if a patient is, uh, has a head that is rotated at the time of the injury, you have sort of a balance between the midbrain and the thalamus, and all the rest of the brain around it is torqued around that. And so the best way to look at that is if you had a uh, jello mold in the shape of a brain in a container that was like the skull, and then you just shook it a couple of times, and you'd see shear through the middle of it, which is essentially what you're seeing with diffuse axonal injury. Uh, the other issue is how do you diagnose it? Everybody looks at CAT scans, which won't show it very well at all, if at all, majority do not. MRI, T2 weighted, T2 weighted will do that. And then probably one of the neatest new tools is tensor diffusion imaging, which is just wonderful. And then the third issue is the blood-brain barrier, which is responsible for keeping things that shouldn't be in the brain out of the brain, is um, impacted significantly. And there's two major issues here. The first is, uh, on a pathophysiological point, you have coming into the brain neurotoxic chemicals because the blood-brain barrier is essentially not working. Okay. The most negative part of that is that state of inappropriate functioning can last from days to a month. And what's most important there for patients is when they come to see me or anyone who does this work and say, you know, I, I had this head injury last week and, you know, five days ago, whatever, and so I examine them and then they say, all right, what's my diagnosis and how bad is it? And I say, all right, it's not so bad. But the problem is I can't give you a final diagnosis. Why? Because the, if, if the blood-brain barrier is still dysfunctioning, and I don't know, okay, uh, it might take up to a month to really determine after a second examination, a full examination, what your final injury status would be. So that's a major impact on dealing with patients. Another major impact is that even a mild blow to the head, a quote, mild concussion, um, again, it's in that minor traumatic brain injury spectrum, but the real issue is it can create things such as dysregulation of the blood vessels, okay? You have metabolic changes, and there are pictures using uh, FDG PET scans, um, fluorodeoxyglucose PET scans that show 
the lack of metabolic activity after a minor traumatic brain injury or, as, or a concussion is looks almost the same as that of a, a severe brain injury patient with in a coma, okay, or in a chronic vegetative state or minimally conscious status is another term. Uh, basically, after that blow to the head, you have neurometabolic cascade changes, as I indicated. You have blood-brain barrier, diffuse axonal injury, possibly, and so on. You need to rest, okay? The brain needs to stop. There are laws that state uh, in 40, one states in the District of Columbia that a child um, or a, a going up through high school who has a real bump on the head um, hitting helmet to helmet for instance and who has some issue like dizziness, feeling dazed, uh, doesn't have to have a loss of consciousness, that's another very important point. Uh, you can have a TBI, minor traumatic brain injury without loss of consciousness, totally. But what happens is they're supposed to be taken out of the game for a, minim or for a minimum of 24 hours. Problem is, um, who calls that minimum? Child doesn't tell their parents, they go back to school the next day, hey, I'm fine. Okay, some laws, uh, like in, in New York, Cuomo, uh, signed one that said that they need to have a doctor's note. Okay, that's fine. The issue is it takes seven to ten days to fully recover from a significant blow to the head or uh, minor traumatic brain injury or uh, con severe concussion, moderately severe concussion. And the issue is during that period of time prior to recovery, the brain becomes much more vulnerable to a second blow. So if, you ha if you're not fully compensated back to normal, which is what happens to, you know, 80% or more of these patients within days, okay, or weeks, basically a second blow to the head within that vulnerable period from the time you got hit to when it should be uh, okay, you know, everything is resolved. So if you have a second blow to the head here because you're not playing, you're still playing, you're not resting, that can be, turn into a fatal incident. It's called second impact syndrome. And then you have the issue of the um, NFL players with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. These are people that for years are hitting head to head and Usually they'll have a, a game and they'll go days or weeks before the same thing may happen again. But these people routinely will get multiple instances of traumatic brain injury, not just concussion. And over time, it creates significant pathophysiological changes in the brain. And so when they retire at the age of 45 or, or more so, uh, there are significant problems with cognition, with memory, with mood, and so on. And this is why chronic traumatic encephalopathy is becoming much more of an issue that we're trying to deal with.